You know, Halloween is a time where, you know, all of the, the things that scare us kind of tend to rise to the surface. I mean, how many of you are scared of spiders? Anybody in here, like, scared of spiders? How about snakes? Snakes? I saw this really cool thing online, and I thought about setting it up today, but I didn't want to put you guys to the test. But it was like a cooler. You, you put a rubber snake in there that looks really realistic, and you put like a, a sign on it that says free beer or free pop or whatever. And then you tie it like a string, and so when you open it up, the snake like jumps out at you. It's like, That's really funny. I, I like to scare people. I mean, ask my kids. Like, if, if it's dark in the house and dad's missing, watch out, because you're probably going to get scared. And it's fun. I know that, that um, I'm probably going to get smacked every time I scare my wife, but I just kind of brace for it and do it anyway. And, and ask the guy that I work with, uh, Pastor Josh, if I don't like to scare people. And it is a blast. And it can get you in trouble, so be careful. But... I think that this is a good opportunity to say, you know, what are some of our biggest fears? I mean, besides things like snakes and spiders, what are some of your biggest fears? What's that? Losing your job. Losing someone that's close to you. Right? Losing a, a friend or a family member. Failing. Failing. Anybody else? Some of your biggest fears. This question came up when we were at the Think Next conference in Dallas a couple weeks ago with our team. And it's interesting hearing from a, a room full of church leaders, mostly pastors, some of the, the fears that they have. And I could just go right down that list and almost every one of them go, yep, that's me. Yep, that's me. But I wanted to be uh, transparent a little bit and share with you some, from my perspective, some of the greatest fears that, that I have. Uh, one of my greatest fears is that I lead a church, but I get to, to the end of my life and I don't qualify for heaven. Right? That I've, I've led, but I, I haven't a chief servant. How about, maybe you can follow along with me, being able to lead a church, but not being able to successfully lead my family. Or maybe not even be able to successfully lead the church. <laughs> I mean, it is a church plant after all. I mean, we celebrated five years, but it seems as though we're still extremely fragile. You know, and as we, we transition from one facility to the next, or uh, we, you know, we try to make sure there's always funding there to make sure the bills are paid, that the future mission is going on, that, that, that something I say or something that I do or some decision that I make could actually shake the whole foundation. Kind of like a Jenga puzzle. Gosh, those are, those are some pretty big time fears. Fears that... You know, I stand up here and I speak to a, a group of people. And have you ever played that telephone game where you tell one person one thing and then you get to the end of the line and it, it sounds something completely different? And I just know that if I stand up here and I talk to 100 or 200 different people because of your different backgrounds, your experiences, how your morning has went, how your marriage is, you hear me from a different perspective. And that somewhere in there, there's going to be this loss in translation. But, but what concerns me probably the, the most is that when I open up and I preach and I teach the Word of God, that it actually says that those who, who do that are judged to a higher level. And if I mess that up, like it's not just me that I mess up. Right? It's everybody who's listening to me. Those, those are things that I take pretty hard. It, it's super hard also whenever you're in a, a position of leadership where you're gathering people around and guess what? I think probably all of us fear rejection. And as you're gathering people around thinking that, that as I do so, am I here to please God or am I here to please people? <clears throat> Right? And sometimes when you're seeking to please God, people don't like what you say. And that's a hard place to be at. And so those are just maybe some of my fears. And 
if you wanted to unpack them a little bit more, I'm sure we could. But my guess is that you probably have your own. A fear of the unknown. A, a fear of failure. A fear of loss. A fear of people. Or people pleasing. How many of those fears like just, just cripple us? We don't do something because we're afraid we might do it wrong. But when we do it, we don't maybe give it our all because we're afraid that that's too big of a risk and it's going to hurt too much if we fail. Or maybe we, we do it all, we risk it all, we go to the nines, but then nobody shows up and now, now we really feel rejected. <coughs> right? Those are just maybe some of the things that we go through in life. And then you throw into there things like not being able to pay the bills, right? Maybe job isn't going so well. Maybe my kids are, are falling away from their faith or maybe my parents didn't raise me in the right home and maybe there was some sort of abuse or an addiction or neglect. And all of those things just kind of stir up the pot a little bit, don't they? And then there's this psalm, right? I, I think we, we come across it all the time. Even if you're not a believer, like even if, if you rarely uh, attend a church service, you have probably heard Psalm 23, right? And as I'm going through this week doing Psalm 23, I'm thinking of some, some different musical artists that have used Psalm 23. The one for my generation is Coolio, Gangster's Paradise. And so that's what song's been kind of playing in my head this week. Sorry, that's just the way it is, right? Come along and ride on the fan. Never mind. So... <laughs> Psalm 23, and like the old school thing is to do these, these group readings together. And so we're going to actually do this with Psalm 23. And if you want to go to your Bibles and get there, you sure can. It's also going to be on the screen in front of you. Psalm 23, and we're going to read it together, page 458 in the Bibles that we provide. I'll give you just a second to get there. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Gosh, we've heard it so many times. And, and maybe somebody along the way has unpacked this for you and, and kind of brought you along on a journey of what this means. But I think that one of the reasons it's so popular is because there is a depth of meaning, right? That a shepherd is somebody who leads, protects, and provides for people. And you and I are so desperate to have somebody lead, protect, and provide for us. The question that we're going to be asking ourselves today is who is our shepherd? Who, who is your shepherd? When things get difficult, when things get tough, whenever you have fears and frustrations, when you don't know where to turn, where do you turn? And it says the Lord is my shepherd. A shepherd is something that, that in Nebraska, I think most of us we kind of have an understanding of, right? A shepherd is somebody who tends to the sheep. But his shepherd was so much more than that, right? It could be somebody who's watching over a flock, but it was also used of, of those who are in any kind of leadership capacity, right? If you were a king, you were shepherding a nation. Many believe that the psalm was written by David, and they're probably right, right? And David would have known this idea of being a shepherd. And we can go back to when he was first called Samuel. Uh, he went to the, 
to his house and he was looking through his siblings trying to find the next king of Israel who would be king after Saul. And he went through all of the, the boys in the house and not one of them met God's criteria. But then he went back to, to David's dad and said, surely this isn't it, is it? Well, there is one more. Right? He's out taking care of the sheep. David knew what it was to be a shepherd. David later on was called a shepherd, a shepherd of God's people. He was the king of Israel. So if you are a teacher, a leader, a parent, you are shepherding somebody, right? If you are a student, an employee, you are being shepherded by somebody. If you're a citizen of the United States of America, you're being shepherded by somebody. If you're a part of a church family, you're being shepherded by somebody. Somebody is tending to your needs. They are leading you, protecting you, and providing for you. And so the Lord is my shepherd is a declaration of David and, and hopefully of us, of something great and profound because we can turn to a lot of different leaders to lead us. Right? We live in a, a day and age where you can pull up anything that you want to believe on the internet and find somebody that's going to vouch for you. Right? And they can be your shepherd. You can pull up any kind of YouTube video and find somebody with some sort of crazy conspiracy and you can buy into that and they can be your shepherd. Right? You can go to any kind of church that's going to lead you into any kind of strange doctrine and they can be your shepherd. You can avoid church altogether and you can wrap yourself up in work and work can be your shepherd. The leaders there can be your shepherd. The dollar can be your shepherd. Right? You can wrap yourself up in the pursuit of education. And if I can just know enough, then I can be my shepherd, right? The, then I can make sure that I'm provided for, that I'm protected, that I am leading me because nobody else is going to get that position, right? So who is my shepherd? I think of it kind of like mentorship, if you will. So if, if you were working at a particular job, Right? And you're running this machine and, and the person came in who owned the plant, owned the machine. Maybe they invented the machine. They come in, they go, oh, dude, you want me to show you how to do some really cool stuff on this? And most of us would be like, yeah. Right? There's a special level of importance that's given to me. There's a special level of training, of mentorship. Right? And, and whenever the, the, the rubber hits the fan, right? Rubber, road, fan. Yeah, you get it. <laughs> Whenever it hits the fan, you know that that person's got your back. Right? You know that that person's going to make a difference in your life. If you've got that special teacher, right, that just kind of takes you under their wing in school or in college, they're going to provide for you, tend to you, and make sure that things are, are set up and that you're ready to succeed. If you have that kind of parent who's, gonna, who's just going to wrap you in love and give you every possible tool to succeed, you and I are going to buy that. And so I want you to think of it from this perspective, if you will. So David is making a, pro a proclamation. This is a song about his trust in God. And so when he's stepping to the edge of the cliff and making this bold proclamation in the face of his enemies, it's like, the Lord is my shepherd. You hear that? Like, the one person that's got my back, that's God. Right? So I don't care who you are. I don't care how many times you say boo, how many dark corners you hide in. I don't care what you bring to the table. The Lord is my shepherd. Right? So how many of us bring that kind of bold faith and trust in God to the table when we're facing our fears? I would say that more often than not, we kind of cower amidst our fears. Right? It, it kind of reduces our potency. We kind of just cower in the corner, if you will, instead of boldly taking them on. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That means He's given me everything that I need. For those of us who've been in the Word of God, we understand that God has this crazy way of just kind of providing for today. It's just infuriating. Because you and I, we want to know that we're ready to go for tomorrow and the next week and the next month. We want to know that you know we've, we've got our, our investment portfolio stocked and we're taken care of. But God has this thing He calls manna. 
And it's bread from heaven. And He gives it by the day. And He did it for Israel. And He continues to do it for you and I. And there are, there are times, days, right? Where we come in and we are empty. And we don't know how we're going to get the next thing accomplished. And God provides for the day. And we come to God and we're like, Okay, that was awesome, God. What about tomorrow? And we usually get left with this feeling of, just wait on it. It'll be there. Anybody else get kind of frustrated at that? I do, for sure. But the proclamation is that of faith. I shall not want. Right? There's a lot of different things that I really do want. Right? You and I, we live in a consumer-based society. Anytime we flip on the, the TV or the internet, there's somebody with something that we want. Anytime we go to church and we gather around and we see somebody's outfit, there's something that we want. Or we see an instrument on stage, there's something that we want. Right? There's always something that we crave. And this appetite, if we're not careful, consumes us. But David's proclamation is, you know, in all reality, in all of the things that are out there, I have absolutely everything that I need. And listen to the next two verses. Because they explain that a little bit. He goes on to say, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Now I get a visual in my head of sheep in America. And just this amazing rolling pasture land. Probably something like we would see in Nebraska, right? Rolling hills, green grass, just this tranquil stream running through. It's just peaceful, right? It's the kind of place that you and I like. Work has been stressful. Family life is, is just crazy. I just need a time out, right? This is paradise. And if you're a sheep, man, this is amazing. But I, I still like my creative imagination gets to running and I get to thinking like, OK, so I'm not a sheep, like not really. And so what's my green grass? What's my my green pastures, if you will? And I, I think that that I see a word in here. He he makes me lie down. There is a sense of peace, right? That when you come to lie down. You and I, we, we face all of these different fears. We have all of this anxiety in life. But what would it take for us to just lay down and rest? One of the things that does that for me, and I'm guessing for you as well, is a full belly. Right? You pull yourself up to that all-you-can-eat buffet. And it's not just the same old, like, stale stuff, but, like, it's coming out to the nines. And you're like, oh, everything here is amazing. And you eat way too much. And because we don't talk about the sin of gluttony in church, you're completely okay with that. <laughs> and then you're like, you know what I want to do this afternoon? I want to take a nap. That's what I want to do. Amen. And so these sheep, like green pastures, and like, oh, this is so great. I've got so much. Like it's, it's plenty. And then I saw this video on YouTube on Friday that just kind of rocked my world, right? Because it was like taking this group of sheep in that context along the hillside, a rocky hillside, where it, it kind of gets some dew, some condensation by the rocks, and, and they, the sheep would just go along and they would eat around these rocks like that's green pasture. It's like, that's green pasture? They need to come to Nebraska. That's not green pasture. But then they would have these little channels, these walkways along the side of the hill. And the sheep would walk along them and the, the shepherd would actually separate them along this hillside so that the sheep would lean over and they would eat, but they would not get into each other's lane, if you will. But he would lead them along to these green pastures. And it got me thinking about this man and how God just kind of leads us along day by day, giving us what we need instead of just like, Yep, here's the smorgasbord, buddy. Pull up a chair at the table. And I was like, gosh, that kind of wrecks my sermon. That's not where I was going to go with that at all. But that's a really cool thing, right? To, to see how God just kind of leads us, but he gives us everything that we need day by day by day, giving us exactly what we need. And then he leads them beside not just water, right, but still water. And I've, I've read a, a few different 
thoughts and ideas about this. Number one is that uh, unlike my dog who likes to stick its face over a sprinkler hose, like sheep don't like that big gush of water, right? It, the noise of the running water might scare them. They tend to be a bit more timid, right? The, the heavy wool when it gets wet might cause some sinking. You might pull them in and, and, and take them away. But there's something about a peaceful stream that to the, the naked eye doesn't appear to be moving at all. Right? And it's just kind of rolling around the rocks and the, the curves. Again, just that amazing, tranquil place. And this running, smooth, pure water is nourishing them. Think about this for a moment. If they're roaming along the hillside, picking up these bits of green grass that do provide some of their, their moisture content, how amazing is it to, to have this place where there's always a fountain, always a place you can go to. And to know that this God of ours, who if we claim him as our shepherd, we don't have to want. And he, he takes us to green pastures, a place where we can lie down in safety and fulfillment. And he takes us to these still waters. It's going to do something amazing within us. I believe it's the same amazing thing he does for the sheep. He restores my soul. There's some, some of us, I bet, in here today need some of this. Right? Anybody in here thinking like that, that's what I want right there. I want green grass, sparkling water, not the kind you buy at the grocery store. I want calm, right? Maybe your life is a little crazy right now. Maybe there's so many things that have got you scared about what's around the next corner. And you need to be able to say, no, the Lord, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Why? Because he provides for me the things that I need. Guys, I want to tell you one of the most powerful things that you and I can do when we get wrapped up in our fears, when we get consumed by our enemies, is to start recounting all of the blessings God has given to us. How many times do you and I, we pull out that piece of paper and we start writing down all the amazing things that God has done for us? All of the things that are going well, all of the things that are going right. But I can tell you, that the odds are that you are like me. I can fill up a page of a hundred things that are going well. And I can flip the page and I can put one thing that's not going well. And I get consumed by the one thing. Does that sound familiar? And what I need to do is turn the page. Right? I need to turn back to the blessings and I need to recount the blessings and I need to make my own bold proclamation of trust in God that He is giving me exactly what I need. Right? And so when I have times of trouble, where do I go to? Not to me. To my shepherd, who is the Lord. Because He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake talked about the sheep kind of going along the, the mountainside in their own little paths, right? There's a right path to be on that separates them, that, that guides them to the nourishment that they need. You and I, we also have these paths in life, right? And these paths, are, they're, they're meant to be straight paths that like if you turn on and you watch the PGA golf circuit and those guys hit the ball and make it look super easy and they're straight down the fairway and you're like, I want to go play golf and you get out there and play golf and you line that thing up and you smack it and it goes Woo! <laughs> the straightest way the fastest way to get from the tee box to the hole is a straight shot and you and I our life isn't a straight shot right we've been off in the weeds for a while we get lost in the timber and some of us were on the wrong fairway and we need to get back into this right path 
that leads us exactly where God wants us to go. And when you trust in the Lord as your shepherd, He leads you in paths of righteousness. But I think there's a, a little caveat here, and I'm, I'm going to be bold enough to say this because I think we missed this part. So many of us think life is about us, but it says here that that's because it's for His name's sake. You and I were created in the image of God. And we're created to be with God. And one day Jesus is coming back to, to set us free and to, to bring us, to restore us to a right place with God permanently in a place called heaven. A place of green pastures and slow flowing streams. A place where our soul is restored permanently. But the reason He's doing it is because you and I are a precious child of God, right? And you and I bear His name, and it's for His glory that He does this. And so you might be thinking, oh, like, yeah, hook me up. Like, I want green pastures, and I want quiet waters, and I definitely want the restoration because I get off in the weeds sometimes because I want to be okay because it's all about me. And that's not the way that God rolls. And if we want to get to a place where our soul is restored, it's being in His paths of righteousness. Not how you and I in our culture define righteousness. There's a difference. And so we continue to come back to His Word, which also nourishes us. Then verse 4 kind of takes a turn here. But even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Some translations talk about the darkest valley. But the reality is that sometimes the straightest shot from point A to point B is going through a valley. Right? And there's a couple of things that I've kind of learned about valleys over time. Uh, one of those things is that in those valleys, the sun doesn't like always get down in there, create some dark spaces. And in those dark spaces, you and I, we get this fear of darkness, the fear of the unknown, and the fear of what's lying around the next corner. But life is full of valleys, isn't it? Another amazing thing about valleys is that the water tends to run down into the valley. And it gets some of the most fertile land. And you and I, when we walk through the valleys, they can seem dark, they can seem tough, but we can find some substance there that's going to push us through, that's going to help us to grow. But the amazing thing about this passage, it doesn't talk about any of those. It says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Right? Not death, the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. Because you are with me. Remember verse 1? The Lord is my shepherd. Right? I can go through the dark valleys. I can go through the dark times because I know who's with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Why? Because the rod is like a, a whoop'em stick, right? And so anytime the enemies would come through, like, boom, boom, like, think Lord of the Rings, got nothing on this. <laughs> Thor, you know, he had to be, you know, worthy to, to yield the hammer. Think about God coming through. Are right, you and I, like, we kind of cower in the front. But God's got are back. And he's got the stick. And he's there carving a path. As we go through the, the shadow, he's moving the enemies away. The other thing that he's doing is he brings with him another tool. Your staff. The staff is it's got a hook on it. I mentioned before like how you and I we tend to kind of get off in the weeds or on the other fairway or lost in the timber someplace. And the shepherd just reaches out to the sheep and with a nudge of the hook puts them on the right path. I will not fear because your rod against my enemies and your staff to redirect me, they bring me comfort. In verse 5, it's completely different. 
You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. As far as I know, sheep don't eat on tables. You anoint my head with oil. They do anoint sheep's heads with oil. That's interesting. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You prepare a table. We're back to this food thing again. No wonder Christians like to eat so much. Yeah. <laughs> and where is this table at? I'll tell you two things. Number one is the imagery is that of a king in his palace. Right? There is a table. Guess how they eat at the king's palace? It's legit. Right? And you bring it out and, and everything is on that table. And you and I get to dine with the king. But guess what? The enemies, they're not annihilated. The enemies, they're looking through the, the picture window. Right? And, and two things that they notice. Number one, we are in the presence of the king. And number two, they're not. The crazy thing that you and I need to realize is that when the Lord is our shepherd, we are in the presence of the king. Right? He is providing our needs. That cup that's on our table, the cup that they would give to their guests coming in of wine is overflowing. Now, that doesn't mean messy. Right? It actually means that the blessings of the king are abundant and overflowing into our lives. That you and I, we have a bottomless cup. It doesn't run dry. Right? And, and he anoints my head with oil. They would do this as guests would come in. They would take some olive oil and they would put some perfumes and spices in there to make this fragrant. And they would pour it over their heads. Right? Because this was a, a blessing. This was an anointing. But what we may miss and what I've heard through my studies is that the sheep would be subject to these flies that would fly up into their nose and lay eggs and these eggs would become worms and these worms would just make them crazy. And they would beat their heads against rocks. Right? Just really mess with them. There were other annoying things as well, but they would take oil and they would... They would put a protective layer, layer over the head of the sheep. And when they put this protective layer, layer over, they were experiencing the blessings and the protection of the shepherd. And you and I have the protection from God Himself. You anoint my head with oil. You protect me. Right? You set me apart. My cup, it overflows. And then it goes on to talk about these days, right? Surely goodness and mercy, those are some of the blessings that flow. They'll follow me all the days of my life. Anybody here not need a little mercy sometimes? Do some things wrong and need to be brought back to what's right? All the days of my life. Now at this point in time and in our point right here today, all of the days of our life, it may mean today, right? Right? It may mean that we grow to be 120 years of age. And it extends to that point as well. But what we know is that God's got our back the entirety of that time. And where do we get to live? In the presence of the Lord. The Jewish people at this time would know that that was in the tabernacle, the, the temple. Right? The, in the most holy place. And so now in the temple, they could go in, but they couldn't go in, right? That was reserved only for the priests, and you had to go through training. And it was only one at a time, and it was a very dangerous job to go into the presence of the king. But my presence is with God. And you and I are promised that. Let me share with you a few other thoughts. In verses 1 through 3, this is a proclamation of David to all of the people. The Lord is my shepherd. Right? I shall not want. Why? Because He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. But what's it say in verse 4? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Right? You and I... We have this opportunity to take the, 
the bold proclamation from the people and make it an act of worship before God. But then another uh, amazing thing is it's impossible for me to read Psalm 23 without reading it through the context of the New Testament. So we take that and we overlay it with John, John chapter 10 specifically, right? Where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. I lay my, down my life for my sheep. Right? Jesus is our shepherd. Jesus is the one that restores our soul. Jesus is the one that brings us comfort. And the amazing uh, thing is in John, it doesn't just say he's a good shepherd. There's a lot of I am statements. He says, I am the living water. Right? He who drinks of my cup, it will never run dry. He also says, I am the bread of life. Right? I'm the one that brings you fulfillment. And so if we, you and I, turn to Jesus as the bread of life and the water of life, and, and we understand that he is our good shepherd, guess what? One day, you and I get to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I, I'm pretty sure that in Genesis and in Revelation, it kind of describes this dwelling place of God as a pretty amazing place, right? Of green grass, of still waters, of rest and restoration. Guys, this is the promise of God for you and I, regardless of all the craziness that we're going through. Uh, David, he had some crazy enemies. We could go through a lot of them. But I want to guide you to three specifically, and just very briefly. The number one enemy that I think of when I think of the life of David is a man named Goliath who was nine feet tall, and nobody else wanted to take him on. Why? Because he was nine feet tall, and he was huge. And he could lift a lot of weight. I mean, they talk about his iron or his, his armor and his spear. And it's just crazy, like a 15-pound spearhead. And he's chucking this thing. Yeah, don't mess with that. So David comes to bring lunch to his brothers who are fighting this battle with King Saul. They're all kind of cowering. Nobody wants to take him on. But David's like, dude, let me at him. Like he is he's speaking against us. He's speaking against God. And I'm not going to have any part of this. God is with us. Let's go make this happen. And so, long story short, David charges out there without any kind of armor with the weapon of a shepherd, his stone and his sling. And in one shot, boom, bullet between the eyes. Goliath goes down. Well, you don't read about him in any storybooks. My favorite part, he lops off his head. He goes, ah! <laughs> hey, you like me now, Right? It's just this moment of glory before God. And David, man, even as a young boy, didn't seem to fear the enemy. Right? That God has is, is got my back. The Lord is my shepherd. And he would charge off into battle. He had another enemy. It was the king, King Saul. And you can take this a lot of different directions, but basically, King Saul was envious of King David. All of his success, all of his glory. He was afraid that he was going to supplant him, which he eventually would. But David, he had so much respect for the king that he wasn't going to speak ill of him or take him on while he was still the king. Right? And so he is, he's running for his life, but just to protect and preserve what God has, has called him to, but he has to wait. And he and his guys, they're hiding inside of a cave. And Saul comes up with his guys takes a time out, I need to, you know, relieve myself, goes to the cave to relieve himself. And David comes up to him and snips off the corner of his garment. I will never forget when I heard a pastor speak about this one time, the depth of knowledge and insight that I gained. And that is that, that this would be like a, a Jewish prayer shawl that on the corner of it has five knots representing the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The law, or otherwise known as the life. And when he snipped the corner of his garment, he was literally taking life from Saul. And so when Saul stepped away, hey buddy, I could have taken you out, but I didn't. Right? He waited patiently. Saul kind of took care of his own death on his own hands. David had nothing to do with it. But you know what? He didn't stand up and fight boldly like taking on Goliath. He waited on God to do what only God could do. 
But the third enemy I see in the life of David is an enemy that you and I, we all face, and it's probably the most deadly. Right? Most of us, we're not facing these nine feet giants, though it seems like it. Right? This, this enemy that's outside of the camp. And it's not this friendly fire type of thing that somebody who is, who is there with us is, is going to lead us astray, though, gosh, that happens way more than we'd like, right? It's easier to take on the enemies outside than the enemies that you think have your back. But the third enemy is himself. It says in 2 Samuel chapter 11, when the kings were off to war, David stayed behind. He's up there on the top of his palace enjoying a nightly stroll when he comes across Bathsheba bathing on her roof. And so he is enamored with her and brings her to his side. She conceives. And so he brings back her husband, right? Her husband. So that he can cover his tracks, but the husband wants nothing to do with it. So David sends him off to war and puts him in the front lines and has him executed. Because he's trying to cover his tracks. Was the battle Bathsheba? Was that the enemy? Was it her husband? No. The battle was within him. And you and I, we face enemies that are, they're out there. Right? They're, they're these big enemies that are threatening us. And we face enemies that we think, you know, we can trust, that they're on our team, and they stab us in the back. But the biggest enemy that you and I face is living inside of us. And so regardless of which enemy you're facing right now, I want you to do a couple things for me. And this is kind of your next steps, if you will. The first thing is this. I want you to define your enemy. Define your enemy. Who is it you're scared of right now? What is it you're scared of right now? The second thing I want you to do is I want you to recount the blessings of God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Why? Why? Where's your green pastures? Where are your quiet waters? How is he restoring your soul? And then I want you to think through all of these things that, that cause these insecure feelings inside of you. And I want you to boldly proclaim the blessings over the fears. Because even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you shall fear no evil because God is with you. Right? This psalm is a song of declaration of trust. And so here is where it all kind of ties together. You and I don't just have to go to the Bible to read the psalms. You and I, we have the opportunity to write psalms. Right? So I want you to write a psalm to God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yours may not look like that. What's it look like? Because this is your act of worship before God. This is your act of bold proclamation of trust in God. That whatever life brings you, He's got your back. 